um, I can be a very loud speaker, but uh, I read from Sister White. She says that she saw Jesus speaking and he was not shouting. <laughs> so last night I tried to reduce my voice. And then when we went back, my wife was saying, you were too cold. <laughs> so I don't know where to pick this. <laughs> I want to say I'm very, very happy to be in Botswana. Botswana is a great country. Botswana is known in Africa for its good governance. So keep it up. Keep it up, Gamaron. Peter, the entire country of Botswana. Sometimes you stand for us, the entire of Africa, in terms of your good governance. But last night I said something that the ancient Buddhist speaker and preacher said that when God created the world, the last he created was the diamond. And where do you find diamonds? In Botswana. And hence, God, God actually favored Botswana in creation. Maybe you were the last country he created. <laughs> but we also said something. We said there is an affinity between diamond and virtuous women. Because in the Buddhist thinking, Women were the last and top creation in the animal kingdom, isn't it? Yeah. So I believe because yeah. there are yeah. diamonds in Botswana, we yeah. also yeah. have uh, yeah. Proverbs 31 yeah. ladies in Botswana. Yeah. I want to thank my friends, Mr. and Mrs. Malema. Please wave where I'm so delighted to see you. It's a few years since we last saw each other, and I'm glad to see you here. We have a long story with them, which if I begin to talk, it will take half of my presentation. I want to thank the Marabi family for inviting us. You know, after COVID, we will normally preach. We are feeling, you know, squeezed. Where can we go and talk? And uh, lo and behold, we are called in Botswana. Thank you, Marabe family. And may this ministry grow. You know, there is a lot of sacrifice in running a ministry like that. God bless this ministry. I want to thank all of you who have come to this seminar. Because the seminar is the people, not the presenters. Um, so, you make this an exciting experience by coming and participating. The subject we have now is um, in your program written a chastity, life, and family. But I want to change it a bit to read a victorious, a victorious Walsam and chastity family. That's what we need, a wholesome uh, family. Now, we often talk of, 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 of family life, family good. But often time, we forget first things first. There is no way a family and marriage can be successful unless it is well founded on the principles of the Bible. No way marriage can be successful. It may look like it is successful, but without godly base, marriage and family cannot stand. And as we present this, you will see why. Recently, the world was shocked that uh, Bill Gates divorced with the wife Melinda Gates. And, and the wife says this. 
She says, this man has no time for me. It's just work, work, work. You know, they went to look for money. They thought with money they will have a stable family. They thought with money they will solve everything. But after they got millions and billions, they still saw life was empty and they divorced. In dividing, the wife was given 30 billion US dollars. That's staggering amount of money. And yet she was separating with bitterness. Some women may say, if I have 30 billion dollars, the, the husband can go anywhere. <laughs> uh, so first things first, we want to say this morning, the happiness and success in the family can only be achieved when we put God first. Amen. That should be entrenched in our family life. In her book, Patriots and Prophet, Sister White says, true religion brings man into harmony with the laws of God in the physical, mental, and moral standing of a person. So there is no way you can be a good husband. There is no way you can be a good wife if you do not have good physical, mental, and moral standing. Marriage will call for your moral standing. Marriage will call for exercising your mental abilities. Marriage sometimes will require physical health. You know, physical health. To discipline your children. To walk with them in the rigors of life. So we need all this and we cannot have that if our standing with God is weak. In the same book, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 601, she continues and says, to secure a strong, well-balanced character, both the mental and the physical powers must be exercised and developed Mental powers, character, character. Some people lack character. We only wear suits, but sometimes our characters are in question, even inside those suits. So we, we need to have proper, good, moral standing before we can talk of a wholesome marriage. Now, it is interesting that marriage was formed before man fell. And in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore a man shall leave the father. The man shall leave the father. And shall cleave unto the wife. And the two shall become one. And I want you to realize that this was given before the fall. A man shall leave the father. This was given to Adam. Now who was Adam's father? God. God. So marriage is so important that even the cleaving of Adam to the father, God himself, when marriage came in, God says, you shall now leave the hold you have on me and you shall cleave to your wife Eve so that the two of you can become one. There is some kind of holiness that destroys marriage. Are you with me? There is some kind of holiness in it. All the time is Bible, Bible. The wife wants some time, but Bible. The wife wants some solace, but Bible all the time. That marriage will also not stand. So the Bible therefore says, even to Adam, before the fall, you will leave the father. 
and you will cleave to your wife, and the two of you shall become one. Now, 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 let us look at this very carefully. This happened on what day? The sixth day. After the sixth day, what did God say? Every other day, God looked at what he, done, he had done and said, it's good. But on the end of the sixth day, he says, it's very good. So when he's talking of this cleaving, this cleaving was perfection of the relationship between a man and a husband. There was no suspicious movement in this cleaving. There was total giving in in this cleaving. There was complete oneness in this cleaving. So Adam wakes up in his dream, in his sleep, I don't know if he was dreaming, but in his sleep, and immediately he says, this is bone of my bone, yes, and flesh of my flesh. Nobody gave him tutelage on how to look after him. He just wakes up out of the sleep. And suddenly, the two are bonding together. Now, I want to say that after the fall, we are going to see that automatic bonding fell apart. It's no more there. But for Adam and Eve, it was automatic. Born of my bone. So Adam was not lying. Because God looks at what he said. What he felt. How they came together and God said it's very good. But today people can say born of my Lord. But immediately they say that. They say, you see that wife of mine, she's arrogant. How can she be born of your born when already you are picking on her? The fall brought in a lot of differences. Now you will notice the word clean. That is used in Genesis 2, 24. You look throughout the Bible, it's only used mainly between husband and wife and between a person and God. So that's how the bonding was in the beginning. And that's how it's supposed to be that the wife and husband will be the closest person you will have, closer than even your mother. So, we need to look at marriage, that it's the closest association that we will ever have. This word cleaving, actually, it was used also by Elisha, when Gehaz, his servant, went to follow Naaman and said, all the prophet says that some of the gold you brought, please, you can, you can help us. And after getting the gold, he comes back and Elisha says to him, what were you doing? Gehaz was an exercising man. He lied and said, I'm coming from jogging. <laughs> and uh, then Elisha says to him that the leprosy of Naaman will cleave to you. It's probably the only other incident that the word cleave is used. And leprosy, leprosy is a symbol of sinfulness. When we hold on to sin, sin will cleave to us. Instead of God cleaving to us, we have something else that can cleave to us. So human beings, before God comes in, they cleave to sin. The word leprosy, which was a symbol of sin, cleaves to the victim. Now if sin cleaves that much, 
we must realize that there was a big change from what was in the beginning to what was in um, that resulted after sin. The word cleave also connotes intimacy. Intimacy means you are fully known to the other person. Intimacy no, means that you are fully accepted by the other person. Intimacy means that you are fully loved by the other person. Fully known, fully accepted, fully loved. That's what it was before the fall. Intimacy, cleaving. It is the need to cleave to one another and it's still a basic need, intimacy, even after the fall. But then the way intimacy is practiced has been distorted after the fall. Before the fall, God says, I will make a helper meet Adam. Helper meet Adam. Now, Analysts are saying that helper does not connote any inferiority, but it's somebody of equal status. Before Jesus left, before he went to heaven, he said that I will send you the comforter, the helper. The Holy Spirit is a helper. Does that make the Holy Spirit inferior to us? Some people read this, that the fact that God said Eve will be a helper meet Adam, then Eve was slightly inferior. But when there is no sin, the word helper does not connote inferiority. It simply connotes an automatic function that the other person delights in doing. So, so if delighted in being around Ada and uh, proving to be an assistant, and I think equally, if Adam provided assistance and found it joy, there was no sense of who is inferior and who is superior. They were equals before the fall. The helper meet. In fact, the word meet means that you meet at the same level. When you meet, you meet at a level. If, if one is lower, then you are not meeting. You will not meet each other. You will miss each other. So when you meet, it means you are coming the same level. That's what it was before the fall. Now, I want us to summarize three dynamics before the fall. There were desire and attraction before the fall. There was clearly a passionate and emotional connection between the two individuals, which was automatic and which became part of the joy. In other words, supporting the other brought joy to the other person. They were to leave their father, which was the, I mean, God, and find joy, even perfect joy, in the companionship of each other. Secondly, there was a covenant commitment, a relationship which they exchanged promises are mutual and they were true to those promises. They did not struggle to fulfill those promises and they saw that within those promises there were privileges and responsibilities. They were totally committed to each other and to their relationship. Thirdly, thirdly, we see in that relationship that the goal of this partnership was to become one flesh. One flesh physically, one flesh emotionally, one flesh in terms of their hope 
and grow. One of the things that we will do later in the afternoon is to have and work together as a married couple have to have shared meaning. Because of sin, everybody think of himself. And as a result, the husband may be pushed, pushing his own direction, the wife her own direction, and we have to make an effort to have shared meaning. But in the beginning, that was automatic. Now, let us look what happened at the fall. The first thing after the fall is that they started running when God came, started hiding. What kind of a person who hides? Surely is somebody, nothing had changed in terms of their addressing, but what had changed was their thinking, their feelings. They ran because they felt inferior. Inferiority complex began to, to creep in. And, and this afternoon we are going to see it's very difficult to love somebody with an inferiority complex. Somebody with low self-esteem. It's very difficult to love such a person. They are running away is that they, they realize they are not adequate. There is something lacking. And then you know when somebody has inferiority complex, they tend to cover it up with many unbecoming characters. So some of the people who are very arrogant, they are trying to hide inferiority complex. Some people who are, 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 are very pushy, they are trying to hide something. Ego that we try to nurse and so on is so that uh, they should know that I am the leader here. Hmm? And why should they know? Because you are feeling inferior. Jesus never displayed any egoistic behavior because he never suffered inferiority complex. He never went anywhere and said, do you know who I am? <laughs> but husbands in homes will start to say, do you know who is the leader of this home? Once you are saying that, you are trying to hide an inferiority complex that maybe they don't understand I'm the leader of this home. So immediately problems begin to crop in a relationship when people have low self-esteem. They begin to act in self-gratification. When God said to Ada, have you eaten of the fruit? He began now to defend himself. This woman is no more the wife, is no more sweetheart. It's now this woman has nothing to do with her. God, please understand that, that I was not there. I am not the problem. Or already a situation of dishing out blame and avoiding responsibility begin to show. When we are doing marriage seminars, pre-counseling, premarital counseling, we always discuss with the people about their responsibility. What will be your roles? Agree with one another. Because right now, we want to have rights without responsibilities. The husband wants to come and sit home and do absolutely nothing, but still wants a very nicely made food. We want to privilege it without responsibilities. And that was seen immediately 
in the nature of Adam when God simply asked the question, did you eat of the fruit? What was the answer? Yes. Yes. But he's avoiding. I hate, but it's not me. In, in the answer, he's trying to dish it. Then the woman is asked. The, the snake. Again, avoiding responsibilities. Avoiding roles that you're supposed to, 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 to have. Beauty and joy of the relationship was therefore disrupted. The sense of harmony disappeared. No longer was there a feeling of wanting to cooperate. That they, they, each one wanted to exist as an individual. This woman now is a destruction. I will only call on her if I have a need. There is no voluntary assisting. There is no being a helper me. I can't help. I will only come to her if I have a need. Jealous quickly emerged between. They found themselves separate and looking at each other with the doubt. Now, when any act was received nicely, after the fall, every act of each other is treated with suspicion. The moment the husband comes and says, sweetheart, instead of being embraced, the wife will look at him. What does he want? <laughs> Everything now is treated with the suspicion. Even the good acts. And that's an automatic result of the fall. Rejection of self and avoid, avoidance of each other. And then a consuming desire to control each other. You see, when God comes, he's, He says to Eve, your desire will be on your husband. You have to realize that this is pronounced in the context of the fall, where selfishness has cropped in. What it actually means is that Eve will desire the presence of the husband to manipulate the husband to fulfill her own needs. And, and that is what it will be in marriage if God does not come in. That the wives will play weak so that the husband can come to sympathize in order to fulfill the wife specific need. Oh, I'm not lovely here. Oh, when you come, you are only in the bedroom with your Bible. Mm -hmm. All that, it's not because she's thinking of the wellness of the relationship, but she wants the husband to her own design. That's how we are after we have fallen into sin. Fighting for control in the family. Even though God said that the man will be head, God said that because now they fight for control. Each one wants a self to be fulfilled. Now in that environment, if no one is pronounced to be head, there will be continual fight. So God had to put one of the two to be head. Otherwise, there will be continual fight. But even with that, it doesn't help. Fight continue. One, everyone wants to take control. Two people locked in a battle for power and control. I will just uh, jump a lot of things and uh, say that even in communication, we lost the ability to communicate in a way to strengthen each other. The problem because one is that oftentimes 
People will not say what they have in the heart. So what you hear in the words and what might be in the heart may be two different things. Before the fall, they would communicate their feelings exactly the way they are. But now there is hiding and we will not know exactly what is in somebody's heart. Instead of sympathizing, you say, hey, be a man, also go, and, and push, and, and so, stop crying. In other words, you are not capable of handling this situation. If I were you, I will take care of this situation. In other words, if you don't do this, there is a consequence. If you can't hold yourself together, you are going to have to quit that job. The husband is telling the wife. The wife is telling the husband. In other words, you, are, you never do anything right unless there is a threat hanging over you. And uh, it has to be done my way. Otherwise, it's not right, whatever you are doing, if it's not my way. Then, there is the preacher kind of talking. It's like, you don't know, you dummy. You ought to learn. The Bible should have come to you. You go to give yourself enough time to get ready so you don't get into jams like this. In other words, the wife comes late at work and, uh, you know, you, you shout at her and say, you know, you know, you know that there is jam at five. Why didn't you rush and drive before five? Hmm? You are actually saying you are stupid. I wouldn't be so dumb as to make a mistake like this. There is a, the advisor kind of people or some communication that we give. One is working on a toaster to even prepare breakfast for you. You come around and you say, whatever you do, do not stick a knife into the toaster. What are you actually saying? That, uh, you know, I don't trust you are doing things. And uh, therefore, listen to what I am saying. I can do anything better than you. If you just listen to me, things will be all right. That's the preacher kind of, and advisor kind of talk uh, we have amongst each other. Then there is some kind of communication of words we exchange or talk um, where we show like we know it all. Let me show you once and for all and how this works. Hmm? You, you, the, the wife tells the husband, I will tell you this once and for all. <laughs> I, I, I don't want questions anymore. What do we mean actually? I am an expert and you do not know anything. There is a, a kind of talk where one acts like a judge over the other. That was a dumb thing to do. I wouldn't do that if I were you. In other words, I can do everything better than you. And uh, there is something wrong with you. Because, you know, you're always at fault. You are bad and inconsiderate. Probably to have caused me into this problem. There is no grace whatsoever in the talk that we have. Most of the talks that we have. Then there is that flatter doesn't tell the truth and want to appear good but he still wants to show that uh, I want you to know I know you are wrong but I am good enough not to say the wrong but he says it in a stylish way to flatter you well I think, I think you are the best cook in all the world but the food that came <laughs> Nobody can eat the food. <laughs> In other words, you 
you are an emotional cripple. If I tell you the truth, you will collapse. So I would rather flatter you to keep you going. I must continually prop you up. You can't handle any problem yourself. And I don't care even whether you improve or not. Mm. Those are communications we share every day, but we fail to understand the deeper impact and what they actually mean um, in between the lines. Then there is this who looks like an entertainer. Mm. He says, maybe we could get you on TV. <laughs> because you have burnt the toaster. <laughs> and maybe we could get you in the TV so that people can see what you really do mm, and get a year of award for burning toasts. Mm. Cause people names, ridiculous, you aren't worth much, you just like your mother, I did you a favor to marry you and so on. I don't care at all about your feelings. We talk and, uh, and cover these in some of what we think are clever talks. And then uh, there is this one who acts the analyst. He's the analyzer. I know you are doing your best to make me late for my meeting. <laughs> you deliberately cause me trouble. I would get along just to find it. Are not for you. I can't accept your feelings the way you do. And then the sympathizer comes down. Everything is going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Calm down, calm down. This morning we were discussing with my wife where the Bible says, uh, keep silent and know the salvation of your Lord. That doesn't mean do nothing. But this uh, sympathizer is telling you do nothing, do nothing. When God says, uh, keep silent and know the salvation of your Lord, in other words, what is your part as human being doing? You must pray. You must read your Bible. You must walk the walk of obedience. But you leave the consequences to God. That's what it means. Keep silent and see the salvation of the Lord. Leave the consequences to God. But still walk the walk of obedience. So that's the sympathizer who say, things will be all right if you sit down and do nothing. And then the interrogator, how come you don't check the toaster in the morning? That's why it's wrong. And then the escape artist, come, let's forget it. You don't take my problem seriously, that means, and I don't care how you feel again. These are wrong blocks to communication, and they have come in as a result of the fall. If we had time, we could have looked at God's solution to this situation. And the, the God's solution is simply to treat each other with grace. And we were going to look at the elements of grace that we can bring into our marriages. Grace means I know your weaknesses but I accept you exactly the way you are. That is grace. And from there on, we work to improve each other. And that's how God treats us. You know, in Christianity, there is what we call justification and then sanctification. The moment you call on Jesus, instantly you are justified. In other words, he has accepted you with all your mistakes. And then from there on, works the uh, process of sanctification. In other words, God working with you so that we can reach the ideals that God will have on you. Thank you. I will stop here. Maybe one or two questions uh, or comments, and then that's the end.